A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, He ascended on high and took prisoners captive. He gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers, to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to to mature manhood, to the extent of the full stature of Christ, so that we may no longer be infants, tossed by waves and swept along by every wind of teaching, arising from human trickery, from their cunning in the interests of deceitful scheming. Rather, living the truth in love, we should grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, with the proper functioning of each part, brings about the body's growth and builds itself up in love. Febum Domini. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. I rejoice because they said to me, We will go up to the house of the Lord, and now we have set foot within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city with compact unity, to it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. According to the decree for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. In it are set up judgment seats, seats for the house of David. Dominus forbiscu, et Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Luca. Some people told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. He said to them in reply, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those eighteen people who were killed when the tower at Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. And when he came in search of fruit on it but found none, he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, 
but have found none. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. Ad bum dawad mini. In our first reading from the fourth chapter in the book to the Ephesians, we read this line. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry. In other, one, in other words, everyone has their gifts. And I would like to focus especially on the apostles this morning. From a meditation I came across titled The Apostolic Catholic Mind. The Apostolic Catholic Mind. And it says this, Apostles are extremely important in God's plan of salvation. In fact, the church is founded on the apostles and the prophets. Apostles lead the way in equipping the saints for the work of service to build up the body of Christ. After Christ's final coming in glory, the church described as the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation will come down out of heaven in glorious brilliance. The names of the twelve apostles will be written on the foundation stones of the perfected church. What greater expression of the importance of the apostles could there be? Apostolic succession is indeed the historical objective indicator that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus Christ Founded. Considering all these facts about apostleship in God's plan, a Catholic should be emphasizing the apostles by doing such things as celebrating joyfully their feast days when they appear on the universal calendar, following their bishops faithfully, who are the apostles' successors, asking regularly for the apostles' heavenly intercession through prayer and venerating the Holy Twelve Apostles in sacred art, song, and devotions. Let us be truly Catholic. Let us want to be apostolic, each one according to his or her own vocation, modeling our own lives after that of the apostles. Our prayer could be today, for example, on this theme, Heavenly Father, give me a Catholic mind, instead of one programmed by my secular culture in which I live. Today we celebrate the feast day of St. John of Capistrano, a priest who, although not an apostle per se, surely not one of the twelve, lived a very apostolic life according to his vocation and state in life as a priest. As a member of the Order of Friars Minor, After ordination to the priesthood, we are told in the breviary, he led an untiring apostolic life. That's the exact phrase that's used. Preaching throughout Europe, both to strengthen Christian life and to refute heresy, which was raging at the time. His feast day is today, October 23rd. Tomorrow is the universal feast day of St. Anthony Mary Claret, the holy founder of the Claretian order, And although the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time will take precedence tomorrow, October 24th is his feast day, and we can see that he himself took part in a very apostolic life. He was the Archbishop of Santiago, Cuba, for some six years, and so he shared literally in the calling of the apostles. And we read this about his life. We read that... As Archbishop of Santiago, Cuba, he visited every parish in his diocese four times, and some of these parishes had not seen a bishop in over 60 years. He conducted parish missions in each one of his parishes. Plus, he administered the sacrament of confirmation 
to those who had not yet received it, some 300,000 individuals. He also rectified over 9,000 invalid marriages. And he did all this in the course of six years and two months. Makes you break out in a sweat of labor just listening to some of these statistics. He resolved never to waste a moment of time. And during his 35 years as a priest, he wrote 144 books and preached some 25,000 sermons. On one trip, in fact, besides traveling, he preached 205 sermons in 48 days. In one day alone, he preached 12. Giving the reason he worked so zealously, he wrote the following, quote, If you were to see a blind man about to fall into a pit or over a precipice, would you not warn him? Behold, I do the same, and do it I must, for this is my duty. I must warn sinners and make them see the precipice which leads to the unquenchable fires of hell, for they will surely go there if they do not amend their ways. Woe to me if I do not preach and warn them, for I would be held responsible for their condemnation. Why? Because he knew what his duty as a priest was. And for the six years he was Archbishop of Cuba, he knew what his duties as an archbishop were. And so to have an apostolic spirit, each one according to his or her own state in life. I know some very, very heroic, very heroic DREs in parishes, laymen and women, directors of religious education, who oversee the entire religious program at the said parish. They oversee the RCIA program, for example, for the catechumens coming into the church. These are very faithful, solid, holy, individual men and women. Some married, some single, some older, some younger. But the fact is, they truly see their assignment there at the parish as truly apostolic. And they're not in holy orders like St. John of Capistrano was, or St. Anthony Mary Claret was. But nevertheless, that all having been said, they see their life as truly apostolic. I know some very holy and courageous parents, many of them homeschooling parents, who truly see their married vocation and their vocation as parents toward their children as something truly apostolic, modeled after the apostles of giving the truth to others, huh? We read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph number 2471, under a heading which reads these words, to bear witness to the truth, we read this, Before Pilate, Christ himself proclaims that he has come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Therefore, the Christian is not to be ashamed The Christian is not to be ashamed, then, of testifying to our Lord. In fact, in situations that require witness to the faith, the Christian must profess it without equivocation, after the example of St. Paul himself before his judges. We must keep a clear conscience toward God and toward our neighbor. Christ himself is the model par excellence of the one who came to bear witness to the truth. And he gave us the 12 apostles. Indeed, he chose the 12 apostles to carry out this mission till the end of time. Holy Mother Church teaches that the office of the apostles is permanent in the church. The word permanent actually appears in this particular doctrine, to ensure that the truth be preached until Christ's second coming. So we talk about the four marks of the church, the fact that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. This fourth mark is permanent in the church. All four marks are, but focusing on the apostolic mark, this mark is permanent. We know uh, de facto that we will have the office of validly ordained bishops till the end of time, precisely because the bishops are the successors of the apostles. 
And to say that the church has this apostolic lineage, this apostolic mark that is permanent, tells us that the bishops, as legitimate successors of the apostles, will always be with us. Now, that doesn't mean that they might have to go underground. Look at the church in China, for example. But the fact is, the office will always be there, de facto. This is a doctrine of the church. What a comfort that is. What a comfort that is to know that we will always have the apostolic teaching and preaching among us. Now, let us look at the gospel now. There's a verse or a line from today's gospel that says, from Christ's own own mouth, perhaps it will bear fruit. If not, cut it down. Perhaps it will bear fruit. If not, cut it down. Jesus said that we either bear fruit or we get cut down. In other words, we either lead people to Christ or come to a tragic end. Why is Jesus so direct with us in today's gospel? It is because he loves people so much, because people desperately so need to hear the message of salvation, and because the Lord has decided to work through us and leading other people to him, precisely because he desires mediation, he is so direct with us in his teaching. Since we have the words which can lead people to eternal life because of Jesus, we then have an awesome responsibility to speak up for Jesus. When much has been given to a man, much will be required of him. We read that in Luke chapter 12. Therefore, preaching the gospel is not the subject of a boast, St. Paul says. Rather, I am under compulsion and have no choice. I am ruined, in fact, if I do not preach it. I have made myself all things to all men in order to save at least some of them. In fact, I do all that I do for the sake of the gospel. These are words quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 9. St. Paul continues, All that matters is that in any and every way Christ is being proclaimed. Philippians chapter 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingly power, I charge you to preach the word, to stay with this task, whether convenient or inconvenient, in season or out of season, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Surely I put no value on my life if only I can finish my race and complete the service to which I have been assigned by the Lord Jesus, bearing witness to the gospel of God's own grace, Acts chapter 20. Paul was so bold as to identify himself as one of the twelve, to call himself, per se, an apostle. Proclaim the gospel, then, witness for Jesus, and bear fruit in his kingdom, or be cut down. Our prayer in this regard today could be, Father, may I be willing to accept even the grace of martyrdom to lead people to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. And as Ephesians chapter 4 says again in today's first reading, let us profess the truth in love. Why? Because we've been called to give witness to the truth. Let us profess the truth in love and grow to the full maturity of Christ the head. So this first reading from Ephesians also talks about the importance of the individual Christian reaching that fullness of maturity as though in Christ's own stature that we may be fully mature and lacking in nothing. But are we? Or can we still be cowardice when asked to stand up for the truth? Do we have a certain hesitancy, even at family gatherings, if a teaching of the church comes up that we're reluctant to defend? How about in the workplace? St. John of Capistrano Today's saint was not afraid to refute the errors of his own time. St. Anthony Mary Claret surely was not either. The message today is evangelize. Be not afraid. A phrase that appears in sacred scripture in one form or another at least 365 times, one for each day of the year. Be not afraid. Again, before Pilate, Christ himself proclaims that he has come into the world to bear witness to the truth. 
The Christian, therefore, is not to be ashamed, then, of testifying to our Lord. In fact, in situations that require witness to the faith, the Christian must profess it without equivocation. After the example of St. Paul himself before his judges, we must keep a clear conscience toward God and toward all men. Quoting Acts 24, verse 16. And that itself, again, was number 2471 in the Catechism under a title which reads, To Bear Witness to the Truth. I've quoted these two quotes from Vatican II because they are two of my favorites. From the Second Vatican Council's decree on the missionary activity of the Church, the Latin is rendered ad gentis, paragraph number 23, we read this, Every disciple of Christ is responsible in his or her own measure for the spread of the faith. What does that mean, in his or her own measure? It means each one according to his or her state in life. Young, old, single, married, consecrated religious. In his or her own measure. Every disciple of Christ is responsible in his or her own measure for the spread of the faith. And from the Second Vatican Council's decree on the apostolate of the laity, we read this in paragraph 3. On all Christians rests the noble obligation of working to bring all men throughout the world to hear and accept the divine message of salvation. It doesn't say just upon all Catholics, but upon all Christians rests the noble obligation of working to bring all men throughout the world to hear and accept the divine message of salvation. We all have a task by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of our confirmation. This is a theme that I touch upon a lot because it's what our calling is. And yet, a certain hesitancy can very easily surface in our lives, in a day and age where secular culture is so permeated with relativism, with secular humanism, which itself forms a dictatorship that tries to downplay the importance of objective truth. You're automatically called a bigot, let's say, because you stand up for something that according to your conscience you know is part of revealed divine law. And you stand up for it as such. And you're called intolerant. You're called a bigot. You're said to have no compassion. No, we love the sinner. We absolutely love and embrace the sinner. We hate the sin. The absolute highest form of charity one can have for another, besides laying down one's own life for one's friend, the absolute highest form of love that one can have for a sinner is to wish truly and authentically to one day see that sinner in heaven. It's the highest form of charity. So we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. And so in a day and age of a very strongly permeated, uh, relativistic, secular, humanistic culture, we are called in one sense more than ever, my friends, to stand up for the truth, just as Christ did before Pilate. But we always do it charitably and lovingly, again, wanting to even embrace the sinner, calling him or her to the fullness of truth but remaining strong in our conviction given to us by our baptism and our confirmation. So this is a message for all of us in the gifts we've been given, again from Ephesians chapter 4. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others still as pastors and teachers, to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the whole body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of Man to mature manhood to the extent 
of the full stature of Christ himself, so that we may no longer be infants, tossed by waves and swept along by every wind of teaching, arising from human trickery, from their cunning in the interests of deceitful scheming, but rather living the truth in love that same truth that we are called to bear witness to, rather living the truth in love, we should grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, with the proper functioning of each part, brings about the body's growth and builds itself up in love. May we each represent a very, very fruitful fig tree that bears abundantly its fruit during the course of its lifetime. As a tree has a course of its lifetime, so do each one of us have a course of our own lifetime. Where may, may we bear fruit abundantly and always be faithful to the task of proclaiming the truth always loving the sinner while hating the sin, and always desiring to lead all into the glory of heaven by remaining faithful to our own individual task of being apostolic and proclaiming the gospel to others. God bless you.